Okay, well, hello. My name is uh, Jim Johnson, and welcome to today's April 1st presentation, uh, sponsored by the Diversity and Global Studies Committee. Our presenters are OCTC faculty, uh, Mr. Matt Osbach, History, and Mr. David Martin, Chemistry and Math. And they're back by popular demand after their last presentation, Prohibition, Alcoholism, and the Chemistry of Moonshine. <laughs> Today's presentation is in the word of Mr. Osbach, Deconstruction of the Historical Origins of the Female Poisoner Mythology or in the words of Mr. Martin, petticoats and pizen pathways. <laughs> on a practical matter, if you need to exit during the presentation, if you do it uh, through the doors in the back corner, please. And uh, with that said, we'll begin with Mr. Osbach. Thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. Did you just steal my notes? No, my notes. Oh, your notes. <laughs> I may need those. I could probably, I could probably just you know, freestyle it, but I'd rather have my notes. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I uh, just want to start by saying uh, I am not advocating poisoning in any way, shape, or form. If any of you go on to poison someone later in life, please forget that you ever attended this lecture. Uh, that is not the goal of the day, so please be aware of that. Uh, okay, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the images that I have here. First thing, oh, I almost got to stay put, sorry. Uh, the images that I've got here are provocative, and I did this on purpose because there is, uh, in America today, and you could argue the same thing about much of the known world, there is this presumption that disproportionately women are guilty of poisoning, that women are the poisoners, that poison is a woman's we uh, weapon, and I'm going to try and dispel that myth today using uh, several different methods. So I just want to point out that even I am guilty of kind of perpetuating this mythology, right, by using some of these very provocative images here. So um, I wrote my master's thesis on the role of Native American, African, and mixed race women uh, who worked as legitimate practitioners of folk magic during the colonial period in Spanish-controlled areas of the Americas. And what I'm talking about is obviously Mexico, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, the American Southwest, so a vast swath of territory that I looked at. And the time frame that I looked at was roughly 1500 AD to about 1800 AD, so about 300 years that I was looking at. And in doing my research for my thesis, uh, I looked at over 100 Inquisition documents. Uh, where these legitimate practitioners of folk medicine, both male and female, uh, were accused of witchcraft and heresy and sorcery. Uh, and one thing that I want to emphasize just right off the top is that when Spaniards arrive in the Americas beginning 1492, obviously, and moving forward, a period of colonization and imperialism that lasts about 300 years, during that period, uh, the Spanish and the Catholic Church become absolutely obsessed with stamping out folk medicine because um, for Native American uh, practitioners of folk medicine, which again was quite legitimate, uh, Europeans see this as heretical. They see it as demonic. They see it as diabolical. They see it as witchcraft because Native American practitioners typically fuse some, some supernatural elements with legitimate medical cures. And so that plays a role in this. Uh, the Inquisition documents that I looked at often featured a woman being accused of casting a spell on someone, usually a man, by poisoning them, typically by introducing some foreign substance to their food. So that was a consistent theme that I saw in these Inquisition documents, that you know, there was this perception that it was witchcraft. That's why the Inquisition got a hold of this case. But in fact, in most cases, the woman was adulterating the victim's food in some way, and this is the, 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 so there's this perception of witchcraft. As I read through these Inquisition accounts, I was really surprised at this pattern that developed. Women, with few exceptions, were the ones who were accused of casting a spell on a male uh, a spouse, an employer, an owner in the case of slave women, uh, or an enemy by adulterating their food. And so the case I intend to make today is that historically, Women have been viewed as the gender more likely to use poison as an instrument of murder in order to somehow improve their lives. So women are taking agency. They're trying to improve their lives by, by eliminating a problem, whether that problem was an abusive slave owner, a troublesome spouse, a patriarch that uh, just wouldn't die of natural causes so that the poisoner could get his or her inheritance. That's actually a very common way that we see poison used 
uh, both in the old world and the new. Uh, you know, there's a, a person that is, you know, got a lot of money, and they, you know, they just seem to live on forever. And so someone poisons them to eliminate them so that they can get their inheritance. We actually see that quite a bit. My thesis is that while it is true that historically women have sometimes been guilty of poisoning, the cultural presumption that women are the gender more likely to poison and murder endures even today when in fact it is men that are far more likely to be perpetrators of this crime and of murdering in general. So poison, I would suggest to you, is a gender neutral weapon. Uh, and also let me say that this is, um, this is an admittedly brief and incomplete handling of this topic. Uh, there is far more than what I can cover here in 20 minutes uh, in any type of a comprehensive manner. But I think that my presentation will be helpful in, in, in understanding the historical underpinnings, why this topic is important, why women are still perceived in this way in our society today, this mythology that continues, that persists. You are looking at an image of a woman by the name of Lacey Spear. Some of you have probably seen this story in the last month. This is a current event. Just about a month ago, Lacey Spears was convicted of murdering her five-year-old son. Uh, the reason why I decided to show you this image is because I want to impress upon you how grave, how serious this topic is. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at this topic, and it, it, as I said, it is provocative. It's interesting. It's kind of fascinating. We might even joke about it a little bit. But we have to understand that anytime someone is poisoned, there is a victim. This is a very serious crime that is being perpetrated. And this one was particularly monstrous. Uh, Lacey Spears, uh, originally from Scottsville, Kentucky. That's not really relevant to our story here, other than that we are all Kentuckians, and she was at one point a resident of Kentucky. But she was actually living in White Plains, New York, when she was alleged to have poisoned her five-year-old son by administering high concentrations of a salt solution through the child's feeding tube and doing this over a period of weeks until terribly this kid expired. He's five years old. You see him in the image there. Um, but the reason the, the media really got hold of this story and ran with it was because of the nature of the crime. She was actually using social media. She was uh, trying to elicit empathy, trying to elicit sympathy from friends and family members on social media. She was blogging about it, saying, you know, she couldn't understand what was going wrong with her son, et cetera, et cetera, when all along she was the poisoner. And so the media really grabbed onto this because of the inherent shock value, because it was such a horrifying crime, because it was a woman doing the murdering, and obviously because she was uh, targeting her own child. Obviously quite a grim story. One of the things that I want to argue today is that the media's coverage actually perpetuates this belief that women are more likely to use poison to kill than a man would be. And I will dispel this myth a little bit later on in the talk. Uh, but I want to go back and take a look at some of the history. And we'll start with Europe in the Middle Ages and early modern period. So we've got some, some interesting images here, all of them of female practitioners of folk medicine. And I want to emphasize again that we're both male and female practitioners of folk medicine. But women, you know, they had a carefully set of circumscribed roles, and one of them was working as a, a medical professional. This is what passes for a doctor in the Middle Ages in Europe. So if someone is sick, if someone is ill, if they need a treatment, uh, if a, a child is to be born, obviously midwives would handle that role. So women have this set of roles that have been kind of circumscribed to them. They operate in this particular field. And I want to emphasize that European women were actually very talented as medical practitioners. We would call this folk magic. But they had an incredible understanding of what today we might call homeopathic remedies, right? How to, how to boil a plant or an herb or a root in order to treat a particular malady or to lower a fever. Uh, a number of things that they were very talented at doing. So they had this kind of privileged knowledge, this privileged skill set that made them influential and very powerful. Um, and obviously that was all well and good as long as the person that they were treating recovered. But what if the patient didn't recover? What if the patient got worse before they eventually expired? Well, when this happened, we know from looking at historical accounts, often that woman was accused of being a witch, of being somehow responsible for the crime, that she had some other scheme in mind. And, and tragically, many of these women uh, in the Middle Ages and early modern period, they are... Um, they are prosecuted. Many of them are put before the Inquisition. And, and in some very grim cases, they are uh, burned at the stake. So we know that you know, women are trying to do a good thing, right? They, and, and I want to point out, you know, when we think about women, we think that they are naturally nurturing, that this is, they're natural caregivers, right? They care for children. They care for the elderly. So this is like a natural vocation for them. And yet, when things go terribly wrong, often they are accused of something more sinister, right? And, uh, I think some of that has to do with the fact that 
people didn't quite trust these women because they had this privileged knowledge, because they had this really unique skill set. That was intimidating to some people, obviously intimidating men, but also intimidating to some women. And so, you know, leveling this accusation that they were somehow responsible for killing their patient was a way to eliminate them if other people, particularly rivals, did not like them or had some, uh, some gripe with them. I also want to talk a little bit about the role of Native American and uh, African folk, uh, folk practitioners, practitioners of folk medicine. So we've got some interesting images here. I'll go through those in just a moment. But what I want to say about these African and pre-Columbian Native American women, uh, again, both men and women occupied this very unique position as what we today would call shaman or medicine man, medicine woman. But in fact, they were legitimate doctors. Uh, at that time. Now, in saying that these practitioners of folk medicine, that they were legitimate, let me qualify, qualify this by saying uh, that indigenous African and Native American societies, healers blended legitimate medical cures with supernatural elements. So for example, they might treat an illness with a legitimate medical remedy. It might be aloe, it might be some sort of medicinal plant, but they would often couple that with some supernatural element. It might be an incantation, it might be a ritual, it might be, they might blow tobacco smoke on the person. They might, uh, they might use a, um, uh, maybe a plant that had some trans-narcotic or hallucinogenic or even mildly toxic property, things like morning glory scenes or seeds or uh, peyote, um, uh, marigold flowers, all of these were used by indigenous practitioners of folk medicine. Now, uh, let's take a look at the images because they are, I think, illustrative of what I'm talking about here. If you look at the one on the top right, that is an image that was produced by indigenous artists, Aztec artists or Mexica artists, that's where we get the word Mexico from, uh, in the mid-1500s. So this is an image produced by Aztec artists in an attempt to convey to future generations what Aztec medicine looked like. And it, it really does describe what I'm talking about here. You see there on the right, you've got one of two shaman, and these are males in this case. But you can see he is administering, that one on the right, some sort of what is probably a legitimate medical cure. And then the other individual is actually blowing on a conch shell, right? So he's using music. So there is this, this, this other more supernatural element. And I will tell you that in indigenous societies and African societies, they saw no, they had no qualms about this. They could easily mix supernatural and medical elements without any problems. There was no compromise, or, or they were easily able to blend these types of practices. But there are other images here that I think are really important too. If you look at the one on the left there, that is a Navajo shaman, that is a medicine woman. So when we think about Northern Native American societies, don't we usually think about medicine men or shaman? We don't think about women so much, but in fact, women were actually very important in this role. Uh, so we have this Native American shaman, another image of a Native American shaman there, bottom right. But the one that I think is really valuable is, are those, those two images there in the center. After contact between Europe and the Americas, as larger and larger numbers of Europeans arrive in the Americas, and as we start to see this kind of class and caste stratification develop, you have a large number of people of European descent living here, including middle and upper class white folks. When you, people of European descent, particularly elites, when they went to a Western doctor or a European practitioner because they were sick, because a family member was sick, because they needed treatment for some illness and they did not receive satisfaction, the person did not recover, as a kind of last resort, Europeans were willing to go to Native American and African cures and healers. Now we look at these images, clearly this woman on the left is a slave, probably a slave. But she also provides another very unique service. She is a healer. She is a doctor. And she is employing uh, folk medicine. Now, obviously, it would have been a combination of African practices as well as some Native American practices that she had adopted because of her time here. And so it is really interesting to me that European women, as a kind of desperation move, were willing to rely on indigenous African and Native American uh, medicine in order to treat a family member. So, you know, on one hand, Europeans are really horrified by Native American medicine, right? They're really terrified by it. They feel like it's, you know, dabbling in the supernatural unless someone is really sick and needs treatment. And then they're like, well, you know, I'm willing to try anything if it'll improve circumstances. So we've got some great images here that I think illustrate that. It is also notable it is also notable 
that both male and female healers often provided remedies and potions and elixirs and spells for reasons that had absolutely nothing to do with a legitimate medical condition. They might pres prescribe a potion or an, el an elixir or a treatment uh, for things like punishing an enemy or eliminating a rival or um, compelling uh, a cheating spouse to return to them and love them again to drive away misfortune, to punish an abusive spouse or an abusive master, again, in the case of slaves. And folk healers, I want to emphasize that these folk healers, when they prescribe these treatments, they prescribe them in much the same way that a modern-day doctor might prescribe an antidepressant for someone who is got a, you know, it has been clinically diagnosed with depression. But in the case of Native American and African and mixed-race folk healers, when they prescribed this remedy, it wasn't for the patient. It wasn't because someone was feeling down or depressed or frustrated. Typically, they prescribed this elixir, this remedy, this potion, this spell, uh, to treat the person who was perceived as causing the problem, right? So the idea was, well, I've been, I've been, a, a spell has been cast on me, or this, you know, I, this, the, I've got this odious situation with this boyfriend or husband or owner or employer who just won't leave me alone, and I just can't take it anymore. And so they would go to a folk healer, and that folk healer would pre prescribe some sort of potion or remedy that was then to be administered secretly, covertly, with subterfuge to the person that was perceived as causing the problem. <coughs> but how were these remedies administered? And that brings us to a discussion of women and the domestic sphere. In America in the 18th and 19th centuries, women of African and Native American and mixed race descent lived and worked in what we today would call the domestic sphere. So we're talking about the kitchen, the pantry, the household. So these are women that would have had a, a substantial degree of trust from their employer, from the slave owner, from the master, obviously from their spouse, to where they could operate undetected in this domestic sphere. So to put it another way, any food that was prepared for a slave owner, for an employer, for an abusive spouse, went through the hands of these marginalized women, talking again about African and Native American and mixed race women. I'm gonna give you one example of how this was so. Um, we know that in cases where African slave women were either being abused or perhaps one of their family members had been sold off or they were just in some sort of situation that had become so desperate that they felt they had to exact their vengeance, get revenge essentially on the slave owner, that slave women would boil fly paper. Now fly paper in the 18th and 19th century contained relatively high concentrations of a heavy metal called arsenic. And so uh, they would boil this fly paper and what happens when you boil fly paper is, um, and this is not a recipe by the way, I just want to point that out. <laughs> when they boiled fly paper it would produce a, uh, a film, a kind of translucent paste that would collect on the sides of the pot of the pan and then after it cooled they would scrape that residue off the sides of the pan and they would mix it into typically fruit or a dessert and the reason why they used either it was usually like a cobbler something very sweet a pie the reason why they did that is that the sweetness of the dessert overpowers any flavor or odor that there might have been from the arsenic and then of course they would feed that to the to the target essentially the person would consume that and then within a few hours things started to go very badly for that person. They would become very, very ill and if it was obviously a fatal dose they would suffer terribly before usually expiring within about 24 hours. It is also very important to mention that in the 18th and 19th century stomach ailments were extremely common. People frequently died from things like um, food poisoning, botulism, trichinosis, ergot poisoning, um, and something called gastroenteritis. For those of you who are not aware of this, 12th President of the United States, Zachary Taylor, a Kentuckian by the way, he passed away uh, in 1850 after eating a large amount of cherries and other types of fruit in, in, in ice cold milk. So uh, he'd, been in, you know, he'd been in power, he'd been president for about, an, about a year and a half and you know, it's kind of a warm summer day and he consumes large amounts of cherries and these other fruits and becomes violently ill and in short order he passes away. And I will tell you that at that time, 1850, when he died, there were many people who believed that he had been poisoned. Uh, in particular, um, there was speculation that pro-slavery advocates in the South who were, who were angry that Zachary Taylor had, had not come out 
strong enough in favor of protecting slavery, that he didn't take a hardline stance in favor of slavery, uh, th that had been motive for the assassination of Zachary Taylor. So there was this presumption that he had been assassinated. Uh, and this endured, this presumption that he had been assassinated using poison, until in 1991 when um, forensic pathologists actually exhumed the body of Zachary Taylor um, with permission from surviving members of Zach Zachary Taylor's family. They exhumed the body, they did a full forensic workup, and they determined that Zachary Taylor died of natural causes, that he was not poisoned, that there were not uh, abnormal levels of poison in his system that would suggest that he'd been poisoned. So mystery solved in that regard. Detecting poison in the human body was virtually impossible until the 1840s when scientists developed um, some rudimentary processes to detect certain heavy metals in a deceased human body. But even then, it would be decades before they had consistent process to processes to detect uh, a variety of poisons uh, in the human body. It took even longer to, uh, to develop processes to uh, detect plant-based poisons in the human body. So, what this means is that poisoning was extremely common in the 18th and 19th centuries, and it was really a very effective way to get away with murder. This brings us to the story of Sojourner Truth. Some of you may know who this woman is. Sojourner Truth was, um, well, first and foremost, she was born a slave in the state of New York. Born a slave, she escaped slavery in 1826, so that in and of itself is pretty remarkable. She uh, escaped and found her freedom. But then she went on to be an important early civil rights leader, an abolitionist, an advocate for women's rights. She believed very strongly that African American women needed the right to vote. So she's remarkable in, in, in that particular area, but she's actually important to this story for another reason. Sojourner Truth, as I mentioned, she escaped in 1826, and in about three years, uh, she came under the employment of a guy by the name of Robert Matthews. Now, if you take a look at the broadsheet there on the right, right you'll see there the prophet up at the top. It's, it actually says the name Matthews. Robert Matthews was a, um, he was the leader of a Christian cult in New York in 1829. He was the leader of a cult. He was also a notorious con man. Uh, he was very charismatic. He drew a lot of people to his cause. He was very convincing. And one of the people that he managed to convince that he was the real thing was Sojourner Truth. And so she became a domestic servant in his household. Um, and as the cult kind of expanded, is this religious group, and, and I guess you kind of call it a religious commune is what it was, but it was very interesting. It's an interesting story in and of itself. Um, Robert Matthews took on the pseudonym Matthias the prophet. He, so he thought he was a prophet, that he was imbued from on high with this power from God in order to prophesy and speak the truth. And so he really convinced Sojourner Truth that he was the real thing. But as I said, he was also a con man. And in 1834, so several years into this religious experiment, uh, both Robert Matthews or Matthias the prophet and Sojourner Truth were implicated in a plot to murder a guy by the name of Elijah Pearson, who was another member of this religious community. Now, Elijah Pearson was a pretty wealthy man. He was also an important member of this religious community. Uh, he actually signed a will and deeded all of his property to Robert Matthews or Matthias the prophet. And remarkably, just after he, you know, the ink wasn't even dry on the document, his last will and testament signing everything over to this religious group, he fell very, very ill, and the, the circumstances were very curious. So, uh, again, hot summer day. Sojourner Truth, responsible for food preparation, she gives him a large number of blackberries from the garden. He consumes these very eagerly and suddenly falls very, very ill. Within about 24 hours, he is going through these violent episodes and fits. He's, he's foaming at the mouth, and he ends up dying. Well, because... Robert Matthews or Matthias the Prophet was a pretty well-known figure in New York. There was immediately this, this the talk of a conspiracy that he had plotted to murder uh, Elijah Pearson. And there's probably some credence to that, I would suggest. Uh, but he wasn't the only one that was indicted. Sojourner Truth was indicted as well. Because she was a domestic servant, because she was a former slave, because she was a black woman working in a kitchen with access to food, she was also implicated in the plot. She was an accessory to murder. Now, what's really interesting about this particular case, and this was a national case, had a lot of publicity, 
What's interesting in this case is that both of these people, both Robert Matthews and Sojourner Truth, were actually exonerated. There was not enough evidence to convict them. Even though there was you know, clearly motive, clearly a lot of circumstantial evidence to suggest that uh, at the very least that Robert Matthews had some role in the death of Elijah Pearson, but because they did not have modern forensic science in order to do an autopsy and detect these levels of poison, uh, we will never know exactly what, or we'll probably never know what exactly happened to Elijah Pearson. So this really illustrates just how difficult it was for prosecutors to get a murder conviction when poison was involved, even when there was opportunity and motive, and as I said, a mountain of circumstantial evidence. So there is this deeply ingrained cultural presumption that women are the poisoners, but why exactly do we think this? Are women really more likely to use poison as an instrument of murder than are men? Well, I'm going to show you some statistics now that easily dispel this mythology. So if you take a look up here on the screen, the U.S. Department of Justice report on homicide trends in the United States from 1980 to 2008, period of about 30 years, obviously accepting the last five years or so. Which gender is more likely to use poison as a weapon? Clearly, it is men. 60% of poisoners are male. Uh, just about 40% of poisoners are female. Which gender is more likely to commit murder by any means? 90%, nearly 90% of all murderers are male, just over 10% are female. So the majority of convicted poisoners are men, especially when the victim is a woman. However, it is very unique here. Uh, when the victim is a man, when it is a man who is poisoned, and by the way, these are only people that are convicted of poison. These numbers are people who are detected and convicted of poisoning. When it is a man who is, um, who is poisoned, there's an equal chance that it was a man or a woman who was responsible for the poisoning. So it's roughly 50-50 if the person who was killed via poisoning was a man. <clears throat> so it's clear that men are disproportionately more likely to murder and to use poison as a weapon than are women. And being that this is the case, why do Americans perceive poison as a woman's weapon? Well, I would suggest to you that a lot of it has to do with our irresponsible media and pop culture. So let's take a look. This is a brief sampling of recent news stories that garnered a lot of media attention, primarily because they were women who were poisoners. Uh, there are a couple that I'll alert you to here just very quickly. This top left image, and this is about a year old, about a year ago, <laughs> the woman that you see in this image uh, was discovered for over a period of many weeks introducing Visine to her boyfriend's drinks. Now, when questioned about why she did this, she said that she was fearful that her boyfriend was going to leave her. He had become disinterested, and so she believed that this was, you know, this was some desperate ploy to try and regain his affection. I'm not quite sure how she thought this was going to work, but she's in jail now, so it didn't go real well for her. <laughs> Bottom right, that's actually a case from my hometown, San Diego. About, I think it's been about seven, eight years ago. A woman by the name of Kristen Rossum. Uh, was indicted on charges of murdering her husband using poison. And what's interesting about Kristen Rossum's case is she was actually a forensic pathologist working for the San Diego Police Department. <laughs> yeah, so, and by the way, this is interesting. A lot of times when we see these poisoning cases, the person that is the perpetrator, the person responsible for poisoning, has an advanced degree. They're, they have a degree in chemistry. A lot of times they're physicians. Uh, so they, they have the know-how. They have the ability, or at least they perceive that they have the ability to get away with this crime. She's in jail as well. Um, and then bottom left here, I'll, I'll uh, remark on this one just very briefly. Last year in Bowling Green, Kentucky, woman accused of poisoning as well. And let me just point out, there are plenty of men that make the news for poisoning as well. Men also do this, but they don't make the news nearly as frequently. They're not as high profile, these cases, when it happened. But when it's a woman, it's really, really shocking. Um, I can, if any of you would like to read more on these stories, I can send out this PowerPoint to you if you just ask me after uh, the presentation. But it is very interesting the role that the media plays. They really hype up, they really sensationalize these cases when it is a woman who is responsible for the poisoning, not so much when it's a male. But I also want to point out that pop culture plays a role here as well. Literature. So talking about British literature from about 500 years ago, the Shakespearean tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. In the literature, it is actually Juliet who consumes poison first, and then of course Romeo discovers her, he is distraught, and he too consumes poison and dies, this forlorn love story. Um, in the film adaptation, and in many adaptations, they've actually swapped it, which I think is really interesting, so that it is actually uh, Romeo who takes poison first, 
because he can no longer stay. He can't stand to be without her, right? And then she, of course, discovers him. So it's interesting how they kind of play with the gender roles in this story. Music plays a role in perpetuating this myth that women are predominantly the poisoners. This is one of my favorites. You know, and obviously it's a little bit different take on it, but I think it's interesting. You see this a lot in, in pop music, in rock music, in folk music, where a woman is being portrayed as poison, and typically because she's either adulterous or duplicitous or she just doesn't love the guy, she's not into him anymore, right? And so, you know, some, some heartbroken guy writes this song about how a woman is poison. I think that's pretty interesting as well. 1945 film called Pursuit to Algiers. Uh, this was one of the uh, Sherlock Holmes films. <laughs> In this film, Holmes says that poison is a woman's weapon. And you see this repeated over and over again uh, in many of the films uh, about Sherlock Holmes. Real popular series today. How many of you ever watched Game of Thrones? Show of hands if you ever watched Game of Thrones. Yeah, it's pretty popular, yeah. One of the primary characters is this guy right here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Meister Picel, guy on the right there. Um, he is, um, I guess you'd call him a mystic, something like that. Well, he's got this interesting quote in one of the episodes where he says that uh, poison is the preferred weapon of women and craven and eunuchs. Craven means coward. And so he's suggesting that poison is a weapon of the weak. And certainly, if we look historically, it's, it's easy to make this argument that women used poison because they were marginalized, because they were at a disadvantage, because they, uh, you know, they were in this position of weakness. But there's actually a lot more to it uh, than what we see here. What poisoners, both male and female, have in common is that they're trying to get away with the crime. Typically, poisoners are trying to eliminate someone in order to improve their lives. So there's a lot of calculation. The crime is usually premeditated. There's a lot of plotting and planning. It's very devious. It's very evil, right? You're trying to get away with it, especially if it's this kind of systematic process of poisoning someone over a long period of time. And so the reason why poisoning, why I would argue that poisoning is not a crime perpetrated by women is it's a crime that's perpetrated by criminals who are trying to get away with the crime, right? The goal of any criminal is to get away with it, right? To get away scot-free in order to live the rest of their life. And so typically when people use poison, it's because there is an element of secrecy, because they can use uh, poison in order to try and eliminate a rival, a problem, an obstacle, and they can get away with it. Uh, so until the development of modern forensic pathology, poison was difficult to detect with certainty, and because of that, poison was the perfect instrument of murder. David, <laughs> your turn, sir. I'm going to talk more about the chemistry of poisons and the physiology of poisons and how poisons work to uh, kill you. Um, when I sent out my title, I discovered that neither Jim Johnson nor Matt Oshbach knew what P-I-Z-E-N was. And so I'm going to make sure everybody in here knows what P-I-Z-E-N means. It's pronounced Pison. And the best example is that your grandmother told you when you were little don't drink the red devil lie because it's pison. <laughs> if you came to our lecture last year, you were taught that if you don't make your moonshine correctly and you'll drink it, you're drinking pison. <laughs> so, we all know what pison is. Okay? Now, Matt, Matt's from San Diego. I forgive him. But Jim doesn't have an excuse. <laughs> I'm going to talk about five major types of poison today, arsenic, strychnine, heavy metals, antifreeze, and anthrax. Now, the first four are something that if you really wanted to do somebody in, you could probably come up with some form of the first four. The fifth one, anthrax, you probably won't be able to come up with that yourself unless you have a microbiology lab and you're really, really, really good at microbiology to come up with enough powder to do somebody in. But the rest of them you could probably pick up at Lowe's or somewhere. Now, first one we're going to talk about is arsenic. 
Arsenic was widely used as a poison in the 1800s and the early 1900s because it was readily available. You could get arsenic anywhere. Um, and we're going to explore arsenic a little bit more. Now, arsenic is a non-metal, but it's right on the dividing line between non-metals and metals. So it's a metalloid or a semi-metal. It has some properties that are metallic. It has some properties that are non-metallic. I like to say it swings both ways. Okay, it's bisexual. Some days it's a metal, some days it's a non-metal. And it's a, like a semiconductor. Silicon is used in computers. Silicon is a semiconductor because of its uh, electronic structure. Arsenic's the same way. Now, arsenic was widely available. Okay, you could go drugstores. We'll show you some pictures in a minute and buy arsenic. If you were a good child and you were growing up in the 1920s, your mother told you, don't pick up and eat any peanut that you find lying around the baseboards because they sold peanuts that were coated with arsenic powder. And the idea was the mice would eat the peanut, the mouse would die. So if your mother liked you, she said, never eat a peanut off the floor. If she didn't like you, you're on your own, okay? <laughs> now, um, we're going to talk about the symptoms and detection also. Arsenious acid, this is a form of uh, arsenic, and in this case, this might be used as a treatment for syphilis, or it might be true used as a treatment for psoriasis, and we'll get more into how that would happen. But this came from a drugstore, and you could get it. Today, we carry around little tins, and they're Altoids. It's a very nice mint. And you hand them out to your friends when they have bad breath. Okay? Back in the 1800s, you could carry around a little tin of arsenic. Okay? And you might hand it out whenever you wanted to, or if you had an emergency situation where you wanted to kill some rats, <laughs> you would have the arsenic that you could do that with. Arsenic trioxide, poison. Um, It is labeled, in this case, not for medicinal use. Okay, this is going to be used for rat poison or something like that. It says, if ingested, induce vomiting, give milk and magnesia, keep the patient warm, and call a doctor. Okay? And that was the standard treatment, that if you did ingest arsenic and you knew you ingested arsenic, you're supposed to try to get it out of your system as fast as you can. Now, sometimes it's too late, but the whole idea was to get the poison back out of your body as fast as you can. And there are all kinds of remedies to do that, drinking very strong salt water or putting mustard in hot water and drinking that. Anything that would make you throw up, okay eating at rallies, anything, <laughs> anything, just get that out of your system. Okay? Now this one is very interesting. It is labeled as a poison, but this comes from the Lewis Drug Store in Tuskegee, Alabama. We deliver promptly, so you could call up, order some arsenic, and the phone number is interesting because the phone number is 131. Now later, Tuskegee got a bigger phone system and that phone number became BR549, but that was later. Now, 
Here's some symptoms. You had a gastrointestinal challenge. That means that you had really, really, really monumental, the floodgates of hell, <laughs> diarrhea. And now, in, in science, we like to follow things in a logical order. This happens, and this happens, and this happens. And it's the way I, I generally teach in my classes is, you got to know this, to know this, to know this. Well, you have this huge GI challenge. That is going to dehydrate you because a lot of water and fluids are leaving your body. And if you have a lot of dehydration, then you're not going to have the water in your cells. And if you don't have water in your cells, you're not going to have the electrolytes going to your cells that you need to live. Your cells operate on ions. Ions are charged atoms. They're atoms that have either gained or lost electrons. So everything inside that cell, there are a whole bunch of ions, potassium, sodium, calcium, other ions that are essential to make the energy pathway inside the cell work. If you disrupt that energy pathway by not having enough ions because you don't have enough electrolytes, your cell is going to die. And once you have cells that die, if there's enough of them that die, you're in trouble. Arsenic would also affect your kidneys because it's killing the cells. It would kill cells in your kidneys and your kidneys would shut down and then you're in bad shape. There's a um, telltale sign of chronic arsenic poisoning. You get a ridge on your fingernail. It changes the cells and the way they reproduce in your fingernails and you get a ridge. So a forensic pathologist can say, hey, I believe they have arsenic poisoning because I have this ridge on your fingernail. The problem with poisoning detection back in the 1800s was that they did not have the modern forensic tools that we have today. They didn't have mass spectrometers. They didn't have a whole bunch of the chemical uh, pathways that we have now for detection. The symptoms of arsenic, arsenic poisoning are extremely similar to the symptoms of cholera. Now, cholera is caused by bacteria. It's in drinking water that wasn't pure, and a lot of people died from cholera poisoning, and cholera had the same symptoms. So you could off somebody with arsenic, doctor shows up, say, yeah, they had cholera, and you're off, okay? No problem. Now, there were a lot of false positive tests. In the early 1800s, they started making tests for the presence of arsenic. And that worked for a while that um, they, they found a problem that antimony is very, very close to arsenic on the periodic table. It is right below it's right below arsenic on the periodic table. Now antimony, again, is a metal, but it's right on the edge, so it's a metalloid. And these tests they had, some of these tests, it would pick up the antimony, because antimony has similar reactions as arsenic does, because they have the same number of valence electrons, which makes things happen in chemistry. So it's in the same family, so they were getting false positives, and they were saying, okay, we have this false positive, we have this test, it's either positive arsenic or it's positive antimony. And you couldn't convict on somebody if you only had a 50-50 chance. So false positives were a real problem with trying to detect arsenic in the 1800s. Well, uh, Marsh, James Marsh came along in 1836, and he developed a better test. 
he figured out a reaction where arsenic trioxide in the presence of zinc sulfate plus sulfuric acid gives arsine gas plus zinc sulfate plus water. Then they burn the arsine gas and a deposit of arsenic is deposited on a cold surface. And they know that that is arsenic by one more test after that to see its solubility so that they got away from the false positives. Now, um, in, in the chemistry terms, the arsenic cation, which is arsenic 3 plus, is um, reduced to arsenic element with a charge of zero, and the zinc is, redu is uh, oxidized from zinc to zinc 2 plus. There's an exchange of electrons, and then the arsenic, which was in the arsenic trioxide, becomes detectable as arsenic as an element. And his test was very successful, and we don't use it exactly the way it is anymore. We use better methods, but for a long time, the Marsh test was the test for detecting arsenic. Part of the problem with some of the earlier tests was that the arsenic compound that they made, say, okay, this is an arsenic compound, we're going to take it to court. So they'd take it to court, and over time, that compound would um, change. And so by the time they got to court, they didn't have what they started off with, and it could not be used as prosecutable evidence. Now, strychnine. Strychnine is a very historic poison. Back in the 1400s, we have evidence that people were poisoned with strychnine. Strychnine is different from arsenic. Arsenic is an element. Strychnine is a compound. There is a genus of trees and bushes, and that is um, I don't have a name, but it's a genus, and that has several species, maybe 200 species, and it has been around for a long time. This is the structure of strychnine. It has a carbon at every intersection, and it has some more hydrogens. We don't show all the hydrogens. It also has a benzene ring. If you look on the uh, left-hand side, that's a benzene ring. Now, strychnine comes from seeds. If you know the right tree or the right bush, you can get the seeds, and you can concentrate the poison. Now the pathway is a little different than for arsenic. Arsenic disrupts the electronic, the balance inside your cells. Strychnine is a neurotoxin. It acts to inhibit the inhibition. It prevents the inhibition of neurons. So what happens is your neuron tells your muscle to fire, okay? So your muscle fires. But then there's a inhibitor that says, okay, quit firing, relax. Well, strychnine takes away the inhibitor. So your muscle fires, and it keeps firing, and it keeps firing, and it keeps firing. And what happens is that your muscles keep contracting. Okay, now if your muscles keep contracting, think about what's in your throat. You have throat muscles, okay? And if those muscles keep contracting, what's going to happen? You're going to choke. And if you keep choking, what's going to happen? You're going to die, okay? You're going to die. Strychnine is very fast acting. It is very... Um, popular in movies because 
you have the actor and they take the strychnine and within an hour they are balled up in a paralytic state and there's a little foam coming out of the mouth and they're dead. And so it's very popular in movies. It's very fast acting. Now, strychnine was bitter tasting. It didn't taste very good. So a lot of times they would put the strychnine in wine and you drank it because wine doesn't taste that good anyway. Okay, I don't, I don't know why people drink wine. Um, and if you drink enough wine, you don't care that it tastes bad. You just keep drinking it. You could buy strychnine in Logan's Drug Store, in, or in uh, Case's Drug Store in Logan, Ohio. And it's interesting here that, again, they recommend you induce vomiting, you apply warmth to the extremities, and you keep the patient recumbent. You make them lie down. Now, it doesn't say anything about calling the doctor. So I think that <laughs> the idea here was you're going to try to make them comfortable until they died. <laughs> so these people were going to die. And again, strychnine is a natural product, okay? It comes from nature. Heavy metals. <laughs> Heavy metals can be used as a poison if you figure out a delivery system. So you got to figure out how to get the heavy, mo heavy metals into the victim's body. First example is lead. Lead interferes with uh, nervous system development. It's very, very toxic for young children. And lead has a bad history. Lead was used as a gasoline additive until the early 1970s. And it was used as a gasoline additive because it boosted the octane. It made your engine run better, okay? And from the late 1930s, a scientist was screaming that lead was poisonous because he did a study and in the refineries where they added the lead to the gasoline, a lot of those workers were dying of lead poisoning. And he brought this up and he says, they're putting lead in the gasoline, then we're burning the gasoline, the lead's going in the atmosphere. It's not good for anybody. But because of political reasons and because of money reasons, he was ignored. But finally, in the early 1970s, we got the lead out of gasoline. Lead accumulates in the body, okay? It doesn't go away. It builds up, okay? Lead was also in paint, okay? They've removed lead from paint in 1978. But if you have an older house, you've got lead in the paint. If you buy toys from China, you've got lead on your toys because they've been shown that they are irresponsible and they you still use lead-based paint, okay? There was a doctor whose family came down with symptoms of lead poisoning, and they could not figure out why. Now, they weren't dead, but they just kept accumulating and accumulating lead. Went through the house, they couldn't figure out where the lead was coming from. The atmosphere was clean, the dust was clean, everything in the house was clean. There ain't no lead in the house but everybody's getting sick with lead poisoning. Well, it turned out that they were from San Diego, California, <laughs> and they had taken a trip to Mexico. And they went to Mexico and they bought a ceramic pitcher. And they put milk in the pitcher. And they drank milk out of this pitcher every day because milk is good for you. And the glaze that was used in the pitcher had lead in it, and the lead was leaching out into the milk, so he was poisoning his whole family, not on purpose. Okay? You got to be careful. You got to be careful. Um, in children, you can have developmental delays in the nervous system development. 
and if you have developmental delays in nervous system development, you're not going to have a happy, healthy, intelligent child. Um, in adults, it can cause mental uh, problems, uh, your, your functioning declines, your mental functioning declines, and in women, it can cause miscarriages and premature births. Now you can treat lead if you can add a chelating agent. A chelating agent will actually bind up the lead and then that will be passed out of the body through your urine. EDTA is a chelating agent that is used in mayonnaise. If you all went to uh, Mr. Mundell's lecture, you heard about how to make food additives or food additives in food and EDTA was one of them. It's a chelating agent. It binds up metal ions so the mayonnaise doesn't taste bad after a couple of weeks because the metals tend to oxidize. So you get the metals out of there by using EDTA. You could also use EDTA as a drug. And that's ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, in case you want to know. Now, lead can pass into your brain. And when lead gets into your brain, what it does, it substitutes for the calcium that is supposed to be in your brain cells, okay? There's a calcium pathway within your brain cells. And if you don't have the calcium in there, you have lead in there, you're not going to be real cognitive, okay? And then you can just become a chemistry teacher or something like that. Okay, now, here's another slide. These are the two legs and the white spots are lead accumulation. This is a young girl and she's three years old and those are growth plates that haven't grown together yet. She's only three years old. Her growth plates are still growing and the light lines is lead accumulation. So this is bad. Lead accumulates in your body. Now, if you want to poison somebody faster with lead, you can shoot them, okay? <laughs> now, the good news is that for lead, we've taken it out of gasoline, we've taken it out of paint, and we're also taking it out of ammunition that used when you, that's used when you go duck hunting or something. They found that the lead pellets, if you miss the duck, go to the bottom of the pond, and the ducks feed off the bottom of the pond, and the ducks ingest all the lead, and then we have dumb ducks. <laughs> so they're trying to take, they're trying to substitute lead ammunition in shotgun shells for steel ammunition. Mercury. Mercury is also a heavy metal. Mercury affects your brain also. Um, mercury accumulates in our food supply. Mercury can accumulate in fish, in the fat, and then whatever eats the fish ingests the mercury. The mercury again affects the brain and it also makes your kidneys malfunction. It can cause fetal brain abnormalities. It can cause muscle changes and mercury is also a product of coal-fired burners. So here in Kentucky we have a whole lot of coal-fired power plants and part of what's going up the smokestack is mercury. Now, back in the 1800s, 1700s, people wore felt hats. And the people who made the hats were called hatters, and they stiffened the felt by holding the hat over a vat of warmed up mercury. So you had mercury vapor coming up, and it stiffened the hat. 
Well, the workers were also breathing the vapor, and it went to their brain, and they became mad as a hatter. And that's where that expression comes from. In Alice, of Wonderland, Alice in Wonderland, there's a mad hatter. The reason he's a mad hatter is because of mercury poisoning. Mercury does a number on the enzymes that you have in your cells. It incapacitates some key enzymes. Enz a lot of enzymes have a cofactor that's a metal. Well, if mercury substitutes for that metal, then that coenzyme will not function the way it's supposed to. And if a coenzyme doesn't function, your cells don't function the way they're supposed to. Um, mercury can bind up selenium, which is part of your selenium uh, potassium pathway, and it will cause cell death. So if you're killing more brain cells, you're not being real cognitive. Now, there's some mercury that is more toxic than others. Uh, pure mercury is not considered to be that toxic, but mercury compounds are toxic. And we don't believe that this is a toxic form of mercury at all. Um, in fact, he was quite entertaining. Okay. Now, this is elemental mercury, and it's hard to poison somebody with elemental mercury. It's a liquid at room temperature. It's very heavy, and it's hard to make somebody take a whole bunch of liquid mercury. Okay, if you inject them with a the liquid mercury, all it does is clog up where you injected them. Okay, but if you make mercury vapor or a mercury compound and you in introduce it into a person, that is what is lethal. Antifreeze two types of antifreeze, and this has been used as a poison. Uh, ethylene glycol is first type. Antifreeze depresses the freezing point. It elevates the boiling point so you can use it in your car so that your radiator doesn't freeze in the winter. Problem with ethylene glycol is it tastes sweet. Okay? It tastes sweet. And it operates by oxidizing to oxalic acid in your body, and your body is not set to handle a whole bunch of oxalic acid. It then will affect your central nervous system, your kidneys, and your heart. And a lady poisoned her family by introducing ethylene glycol into the lemonade she was giving her kids because it tastes sweet and they didn't know it was there and the kids died. Also, there's warnings on antifreeze. Don't leave antifreeze out. Like if you drain your radiator, don't just leave it in a pan out on your driveway. A dog will come along. It'll drink it because it tastes good, and then the dog will be dead. And if you have a toddler, a toddler will crawl out there, drink the antifreeze, and then you'll have a dead toddler. So we've mainly switched to propylene glycol, which has an unpleasant taste and it metabolizes to lactic acid. Now, lactic acid is a natural product in your body. When you work your muscle real hard, you're producing lactic acid. That's why your legs hurt when you run. It's a buildup of lactic acid. So the body can um, handle extra lactic acid much better than it can handle oxalic acid. These are the structures, ethylene glycol, has uh, two carbons, six hydrogens, and two oxygens. Propylene glycol has three carbons, seven hydrogens, and two oxygens. The whole difference there is one carbon and one hydrogen. That's the difference between sweet and not so sweet, and being horrible to drink, and being you don't want to drink it, but it may not be as bad. Similarly, if you all came to the moonshine lecture, 
you saw that methanol and ethanol differed by one carbon and two hydrogens. If you drink ethanol, you get happy and all the girls look better at closing time. If you drink methanol, first of all, you go blind and then you die. <laughs> and the whole difference is one carbon and two hydrogens. Similar thing here, a small difference in structure in chemistry can do an awful lot of difference in what it does to a person. And finally, anthrax, okay? Now, these guys are a band. I do not know why. <laughs> anthrax comes from a bacterium and that bacterium produces a toxin and the toxin can be dried to a powder and anthrax acts because it has three proteins and these three proteins work together to kill you. One protein um, will bind to the cell and make a pathway into the cell. The other two proteins go into the cell and they screw up all your enzymes. So your cell dies. Now you've heard about anthrax poisoning since 9-11 and they were sending envelopes of anthrax to the White House and to Congress and all that, okay? Y'all can't just go down to the drugstore and get some anthrax, okay? You have to have a microbiology lab, you have to grow, grow the cultures, you have to isolate the toxin, you have to dry it. The problem is anthrax hangs around forever. It's a natural um, part of the soil, okay? Animals usually get anthrax if they eat plants that scar the inside of their esophagus or their stomach, so you have a bleeder, and then the anthrax bacterium can enter the bloodstream and reproduce, make the toxin, and kill the animal. So then you have a dead cow, died of anthrax. So you bury the cow, okay? The anthrax continues to thrive in the soil, okay? So you see old Western TV movies or movies, and they're saying, look out, it's an anthrax epidemic, okay? Well, anthrax is, is just about everywhere. It's just you don't want to concentrate it and you don't want to put it in an envelope and send it to anybody. But the, the three proteins act together. If you take away one of the proteins, it's not going to work. And those are representations of proteins which are very, very large molecules. Uh, you can get anthrax by breathing it or by eating it or by putting it in a, in a cut. Okay. Now, countries have developed weapons programs based around anthrax where they have made large quantities of the anthrax endospores and have figured out a way to deliver them to wipe out whole cities or whole countries, okay? And uh, that, is, that is one of the things that terrorism experts are worried about is that somebody, some terrorist, will come up with a way to make a whole lot of anthrax and deliver it into a ventilation system somewhere and kill a lot of people. And we've covered this. Oh, it also in, uh, kills your macrophage uh, so, uh, portion of your cells. So your natural immunity system, it kills that. So you can't get the anthrax out of your cells. Finally, it's, it's hard to see. Uh, this man is blue. 
He's a silverish blue color. And this is just one more thing about poisons. This guy worked in some factory somewhere that used silver in their process. And he inhaled a lot of silver. And the result of inhaling a lot of silver is it changes your skin color to silver. So he is technically poisoned. Okay, he's a nice blue color. He looks like a Smurf. <laughs> and he has silver poisoning. So my conclusion is that things that you can put into your body that will disrupt anything that has to do with your natural processes inside your cells is not good for you.